We read from the Word of God as we find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to begin to read at verse 10. The Apostle really begins the subject of marriage in the very first verse. But because of the length of the chapter, we're going to cut a bit of it out. Start to read at verse 10. Here he begins and says, Unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord Jesus. And what he means is that this is a restatement of a teaching that Jesus gave when he was on the earth. In fact, you can find it in Matthew 5. Unto the married I command, yet not I but the Lord Jesus, let not the wife depart from her husband. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband. And let not the husband put away his wife. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. And there, in contrast, he means that while Jesus was on earth, he did not have occasion to give a teaching about this. But when he says, I, he means the inspired I. So it's still just as inspired. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath a husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, Let her not leave him, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk. And so ordain I in in all churches. Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with the price. Be not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called, therein abide with God. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. I suppose, therefore, this that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be. Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. But I spare you. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they have none, and they that weep as though they weep wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoiced not, and they that buy as though they possessed not, and they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, 
how he may please his wife. There is difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy, both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I speak for your own profit. Not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, and that ye may attend unto the Lord without distraction. For if a man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age and need so require, let him do what he will. He sinneth not, let, him, let them marry. Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart having no necessity, but hath power over his own will, and hath not no de so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin, doeth well. So then he that giveth her in marriage doeth well, but he that giveth her not in marriage doeth better. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment. And I think also that I have the Spirit of God. May God bless our reading of His Holy Word. The text that God gives to us tonight to consider this last day of the year is verses 29 through 31. 1 Corinthians 7 Verses 29 through 31. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they have none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoiced not, and they that buy as though they possessed not, and they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. The time is short. That's the way that the Lord would have us consider the end of the year, and that's the way that the Lord would have us consider all of our life. The time is short. The longer that we live in this world, the quicker it seems that time goes. It wasn't that long ago, it might seem to the older ones of us, that we were here doing the same thing at the end of 2011. To the younger, it seems that it might have been a long time. But God tells all of us, regardless of our age and experience, the time is short. And the implication of that is this. Here he is talking about marriage. And when he comes to this idea, time is short, he quickly applies it to the subject of marriage. And his application to the subject of marriage is this. That that means that those that are married should live in the consciousness and in the awareness that they could live as not being married. Learn, learn already here what it will be like in the glory to come. That's, that's what's being set before us. There are many good things that God would enable have us to rejoice in and enjoy in this life. He doesn't want us not to rejoice in them. He doesn't want us to take the aesthetic attitude that the monks or the Amish take, that, that we must reject all the pleasant and wonderful things of this life, and instead we should deprive ourselves of the joys of, that God gives us in this life. No, there are good things. There are many good things, and we may and must enjoy them. May and must. But at the same time, we must remember, as we enjoy them, the time is short. 
in order to have us understand the reality, what's really real about this life, He uses a figure at the very end of verse 31, for the fashion of this world passeth away. A figure that you have in a play, movies. In a play, that's what Paul was used to, there would be the screen that would be in front of the the platform, hiding everything until it was to begin. And when that curtain would be drawn and opened up, then you'd see on the stage a a, a set. Sometimes the set would give the appearance of being outdoors. Sometimes the set would be in a house that existed a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago. But they would have a set there that would set the tone and the scene for what the play was to portray. No little expense would be put into making the scene set in order to make it more real. Today they don't do that. They, they have the computers to be able to make it seem so real. And we can even put on our glasses and see different dimensions and it becomes even more real. But, so when he says the fashion of this world passes away, it's as if, well, I remember pretty vividly as a child reading some books that were describing a winter scene or a storm, and I would be so involved in that book and in what it was communicating that when called for supper, he closed the book, I would actually be surprised that the sun is shining. And it's warm. Because the setting was so real. Or if you were watching a play and all of a sudden an accident would happen and and the curtain that was the scene would suddenly fall and you'd see behind it just a bare block wall or a wooden framed wall. The fashion of the world is just like that. It's It's a fake. It's real. It seems real. But it can... Pass away. That's the language. Passes away. He describes five things about human life. One, marriage. He that hath a wife. And he refers to the happiness of a home, domestic happiness. While it's true that our marriage form is accurate to begin, whereas married persons, by reason of sin, are subject to many troubles and afflictions, at the very same time, marriage is an institution that God wants to have reflected, reflecting the relationship that he has with his people. And that relationship that he has with his people is one of the greatest joys that we'll, we have. That's the covenant we talked about last Sunday, Sunday morning, yesterday. Marriage can be the source of many joys and pleasures. We don't always experience those joys. There's also struggles. But the struggles are there so that we strive always to live in it as God would have us live. Seeking to please our wife, seeking to please our husband, serving and assist one another in all things that belong to this life and to the better. And then we do have moments and times and sometimes longer than others where we experience all the joy that God intends to give in a marriage. 
He then talks about weeping. Another part of the life of this world, a very real part. There's sorrows. There's business losses. There's economic experiences. There's physical pain. There's emotional distresses. There's psychological troubles that we can have where we see things in a distorted way, but they seem so very, very real. There's hurts, there's depressions. God said it. All those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ shall suffer persecution. The Apostle Paul, when he wrapped up the, the, his missionary first missionary journey, ended by not only affirming them in the faith, but even as he affirmed them in the faith, Acts 14, verse 22 tells us that he said this, we must all through much affliction enter into the kingdom of God. When we sang Psalter number 246, the second stanza, I believe every one of us, the older ones with more meaning than the younger ones, understood the words. Long has been our sorrow's night, afflicted through the weary years. We wait until thy help appears. With us and with our sons abide. There's an urgency there in that request because there's tears. Female tears. Male tears. There's hurts. Another part of life is joy. We rejoice. God gives us many reasons to rejoice. Birth of a child. You look at the list. And we rejoice at what God has given in the safe delivery. Joy in confessions of faith by our children. No greater joy. There's business gains. There's honors that are given. And these are all legitimate reasons for us to rejoice. We may be happy. We may enjoy them. In fact, it could be said that in many ways the joys that we can have as believers are greater than the joys of the unbelievers for the same thing. There's joys. There's marriage. There's reasons to weep. There's reasons to rejoice. There's the activity of buying. That refers to our laboring. Some toil with sweat, with hand in the ground. Others toil by buying and trading. Working hard by buying and trading in order to gain the things of this life, working hard to get ahead, working hard to be able to make the purchases that we desire and as well as the ones that we have to make. We buy. And finally, we use this world. We're in it. We're not of it, maybe, but we're in it. And we're in it to use it. God created man as the head and the king of creation. We are to work it. We're not its servants. The world and the earth is our servants for us to use correctly, to enjoy the comforts of it and the wealth and pleasures that it can give. Now that all being said, these five things, he says, but the time is short. And the fashion, the outward glamour, that's literally the meaning of that word fashion, the outward glamour of this life will pass away. There's a reality that even those little babies that we hold who have just been given birth into this life are born 
to die sometime, eventually. We don't like to think about it. We like to put it off. And while we don't know what, when the end will be, we can always be absolutely sure that there will be an end. No matter how hard we try, we cannot live forever. To those who are without Christ, the fear of that end is most horrible. And that's when the words of Haggai come. Consider your ways. That's when the words of the psalmist in Psalm 90. Set your hearts on wisdom's ways. That's when the words of God through Isaiah to Hezekiah are appropriate. Set your house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. That's not something that we just go to a Mr. Garveling when he's put under hospice care and then we say it. But that's something that every single one of us, those who have just been married this past year, always set your house in order. Live knowing that an end can come. I can't say it in the Dutch, but the Dutch saying is the old must die, but the young can die. For us to live without the awareness of that, to act as if the time is long, is incorrect. No, we don't have to live in the fear of it, and that's what we want to point out. But we have to live in the consciousness that time is short. What does that mean? We would answer that in the light of the scriptures and in the light of this passage of the word of God this way. The value the value of a short time is great. We may say, well, it's short, so what's the worth? The value of a short time is great. When we see that it is an activity of God himself, God is at work in giving a wife. God is at work in giving reason to weep. God is at work in giving reason to joy. God is at work in giving us this world in which we are to live and use. God is at work in giving to us the labor to buy and sell. God is at work in every part of our life. God is at work in a good hair day and a bad hair day. God is at work when we can sleep and when we can't sleep. God is at work in prosperity and in adversity. God is at work in all things. The value of the short time is that this is a work of our Heavenly Father. In the old dispensation, they called him Jehovah, who made heaven and earth. We in this dispensation looking at his son and realizing that through that son he's adopted us into his family, we look at this as the activity of our father, our loving father, who in the making of heaven and earth displayed the greatest power and the greatest wisdom. Well, our heavenly father is using that power and that wisdom to make earth, everything work for us. The value of a short time is great when we see it as the hand of our Heavenly Father working as a potter on us. 
the value of our short time is great when we see everything and every moment as an opportunity to obey. Every moment is an opportunity, God-given opportunity to obey, to thank Him, to love Him, Not just certain moments of my life I'm going to obey him, serve and thank him, and to love him. But in everything. What are the commandments of God? Jesus said the greatest commandment of all is love the Lord all the time with all you have. Don't think, well, I've got a short time, so it doesn't make any difference. Don't think, well, I've got certain times I will, but other times I want to do what I want to do. It's short. See it as the activity of our Father in heaven and as an opportunity, a privileged opportunity. Do you know that that some can't love him, obey him, and thank and praise him? You and I can. We can. We have been loosed from the chains of the devil and from the power of sin. We are no longer slaves to it. We've been liberated. So we can see it as an opportunity to obey. And the heart of obedience is love. And to thank and praise him. That it's a short time not only identifies it as an activity of God, and makes us realize this is an opportunity for us. But thirdly, we live in this short time in all of these five different areas of life, in every part of our life. And we do it as those who are privileged to know that we have eternal life already. John 3, verse, six, verse 36. Although John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Have it. Will have it? No. Have it. So that John 3, verse 36, He that believeth on the Son hath today, in the short time, eternal life. And he that believeth not the Son not only shall not see life, but they have the wrath of God abiding on them. He that believeth on him is not condemned. This realization of faith in Jesus as the Son of God is that which gives to us the realization that, that the short time isn't the end. Without faith, the short time means I better, I better eat, drink, and be married for tomorrow I die and then it's finished. No, the short time for the child of God is my earthly journey will end when the potter is finished in his activity of fashioning me into the image of his son. And when, well, sometimes there's a baby that you bury and it never breathes a breath of this air. 
and it's been fashioned by the hand of its maker in the womb, in the image of the sun. Others of us, he's got to work on. As clay is worked on by the potter, and he fashions us, and he uses tools, and he uses pressure, and he takes clay out, and he adds clay, and as we spin in this life, he's shaping and forming us, conforming us, conforming us. But he lets us realize that when we go through the, the pressures, that's what tribulation means, of this life, the purpose is to give us the hope of everlasting life. When we will be with him forever. Now we count years. 2000, 2010, 2011, 2012. 2003, we count, we count days, we count months. Unending, everlasting life is experienced in the way of believing on the Son, in whom alone there is the forgiveness of all of our sins and the declaration that in him we are righteous and have the right to eternal life. A hope that's secured in our Savior. So then he says, as believers now, as those who are aware of the activity of God, of the opportunities that we have to love and obey and and serve and glorify him and to realize that this life is preparatory for a great, wonderful, eternal life. He says, then it remains to us that have wives, that have mates, to be as those that had none. And what he means is this, taking, taking the picture of marriage in all of its glory and beauty as God intends it to be, he doesn't want us to make so much of that marriage that when it ends, we say there's no more reason to live or we say I can't wait to be with her because heaven is not to be with her or him whom have I Lord in heaven but thee the beauty of Mary is found in the picture and in the type that it is. God did not create earthly marriages so that we could, in the stories, live happily ever after, live forever. God teaches us to live in marriage ever loving and ever giving and ever serving, but remembering that it shall pass away pass away. The outward glamour, the fashion of this world passes away. It has a purpose, a beautiful purpose that God is using it. Giving us all kinds of opportunities to glorify him. But marriage is not everything. To weep as those that wept not. Because the time is short, then we are in our weeping to remember that there will be an end to the miseries of this life. One of Job's friends in Job 16, verse 
11 verse 16 said it. Because thou shalt forget thy misery and remember it as waters that pass away. That's why in 1 Thessalonians 4, he wants us to weep at the death of loved ones, but not to weep as those who are without comfort. He doesn't want us to be overcome by grief and sorrow. But he wants us to realize that the sorrows too and the miseries of this life will pass away. He does that by showing to us this, two things. One, the hurts that bring out every reason for tears in this life. Those hurts, as great as what they are, are nothing compared to the hurts of hell. And then the second thing he would have us realize is this. These hurts, these present afflictions, the, present, the afflictions of this present time, the sufferings of this present time is the way he uses the words in Romans 8, verse 18. He wants us to do it this way. Here's the scales, the balance scale. He says, put the hurts here. Now, don't, minimal, don't minimize them. Never, never are we to minimize the hurts. They are great. God says, I mean them to hurt. And as great as those are, he set them on one side of the scale. And then he says this. You who have the spirit of Christ, the, the spirit that raised Christ from the dead, the spirit that lives in you, the spirit that delivers you from the spirit of bondage, because you've received the spirit of adoption and you can say, Abba, Father. And that means that you are not only a child, but an heir, an heir of God. An heir, not just of a car, a house, a piece of property, but an heir of God. And a joint heir with Christ. And he says, you put that over here. And you step back and don't minimize the hurts. But when you take the two together, then you have to say, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not even worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. <clears throat> He states it even more strongly in 2 Corinthians 4 when he makes us realize, again, don't minimize them. But he says, when you take these and you compare them with the glory that God will give, then you have to say, these are light and this is an exceeding weight. These are but for a moment. And this is forever, the eternal. But he says, you're going to know that not when you look at the things that are seen, but when you look at the things which are not seen. And it's that faith, that faith that says, my life is an activity of God shaping me. My life is an opportunity for me to obey, love, trust, fear, glorify, and honor God. My life is an opportunity to realize that in Jesus Christ there is righteousness that's forever. Then you can say, it hurt. And God meant it to hurt. 
but it's good. Very good. Weep as those that wept not. Rejoice. Enjoy. But never forget that they all will pass away as a dream. That the satisfaction of a 10 ounce prime rib that's cooked just right and its spices are just fantastic. Hot fudge, Hudsonville ice cream sundae. Two hours later, it's gone. Ten hours later, it's in the draft. Gone. Some kids open toys. They got all excited about them. Watch how long it takes before they go into the box with all the others. The first joy of marriage. Then you watch them. And then they find out it's work. It's hard work. There's joy, great joy. Smile, rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice in the Lord who uses the joys. But we are to rejoice more and that I have been given the gift of eternal righteousness and that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You can rejoice that you can cast out devils and heal people, but that's nothing, Jesus said to his disciples. Rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Buy and trade. Remember, remember that it's a gift of God to have riches. Read 1 Timothy chapter 6. But use those possessions remembering that they have wings. That the reason for us to trust in God is to trust in Him when we have millions or when we are penniless. Let the satisfactions that God gives us in buying and in using the things of this earth, using them as stewards, knowing that I have to return them with interest to him who gave them to me. The Apostle James said it to the rich Christians in chapter 1, verse 10. Let the rich rejoice in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass, he shall, same words, pass away. Use this world. Live this life. Look at the last year. And now we're going to go forward. And we don't know what 2013 is going to hold. But we've been using Isaiah 55 for Lord's Supper. Ho, everyone that thirsteth. You don't need money to come to the waters of the truth of forgiveness of sins and righteousness in Jesus Christ. Come, buy and eat. Yea, come and buy even wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread? Why do you labor for that which satisfies not? Hearken diligently unto me and eat of that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. What's that? It's this, that God says to you, 
I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The greatest thing that you have, the fatness, the real fatness. This is Sunday morning that that holy God says to you, I love you. I've adopted you. You're my child. I'm taking care of you. And I'm going to use everything, sickness and health, Prosperity and adversity. I'm using it for you to shape you like my son. Rejoice. God used 2012, and He's going to use 2013. We had opportunities. Everyone that we failed, don't tell them you're sorry, but don't carry it. It's finished. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. God put it away. And in the knowledge and joy of its being put away and gone, now go forward. Thankful. Because everything that he's forgiven me, I have even more reason to be thankful. And may that gratitude be evidenced in that you love him more today than last year and more tomorrow than today. What a relationship he has with you and you with him. That's who you are. Amen. Our Father, we are grateful to know again, again and again, thou dost set it before us. Sometimes it seems like thou art pounding it into us, but we are dull and slow. We're thankful that thou dost keep teaching and reminding and showing to us that the real thing that counts is that thou art with us and will never leave us nor forsake us. We honor and glorify and praise thee, Father. We love thee because thou hast loved us so much first. Amen.